Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar of the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council's Green Chemistry Education Webinar Series. Today's webinar is entitled Chemical Hazard Assessment Informing Decisions for Safer Chemicals, Materials, and Products. My name is Joel Tickner from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. I'm co director of the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council. I also have with me today Saskia Van Bergen from the Washington Department of Ecology, who is the coordinator of the GC3's Green Chemistry Education Workgroup. Today's speakers are two experts in chemical alternatives assessment. Lauren Hine, who is the Interim Executive Director of Northwest Green Chemistry, trained and educated as a green chemist, and the founding mind behind the hazard assessment tool, the green screen. Meg Whitaker, Margaret Whitaker, is the Managing Director and Chief Toxicologist at Tox Services LLC, a consulting group that has really served in a key leadership role in accelerating the practice of green chemistry, working with industry, government, and other stakeholders. Lauren and Meg have together really done extensive work in building out the field of chemical hazard assessment and alternatives assessment. And it is a great pleasure to have them on today's webinar to educate us about the tools of chemical hazard assessment. And with that, let me introduce Meg and Lauren uh, to today's webinar. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks, Joel. This is Meg Whitaker from Talk Services. Lauren and I are very happy to be here today. We're often called the dynamic duo, and we've got our Batgirl costumes on today to talk to you about chemical hazard assessment and GHS, et cetera. We have an action-packed agenda. We're going to provide you with an overview of hazard and GHS, the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. We're going to provide you with an overview of how chemical hazard assessments are performed. We'll identify how chemical hazard assessments support informed decision making, identify how you can incorporate chemical hazard assessment into different aspects of your company's decision making process. We'll provide you with examples of chemical hazard assessments, identify chemical hazard assessment related resources for those of you who want to dive into the deep aspects of chemical hazard assessment, as well as talk about the future challenges and how we can expand chemical hazard assessment. And as you heard, there'll be time to ask questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer all of the questions that we get. I just want to take a minute or two to talk about why we perform hazard assessment. And hazard assessment and hazard reduction is a critical part of green chemistry. And I carry in my wallet the principles of green chemistry. AECS has got a great pocket guide that you can all download. But let's think about the definition of green chemistry. It's defined as the design of products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use or generation of hazardous substances. So hazard or hazard reduction is really at the core of what we're trying to get to with informing safer chemical selection. Five of the 12 principles of green chemistry are really focused on hazard reduction. And they look so simple when you look through these 12 green chemistry principles but it's fascinating to see how we clearly forget them during product formulation or reformulation. But at the core of it, concentrating on less hazardous chemical synthesis, designing safer chemicals and products, using safer solvents and auxiliaries, designing chemicals and products to degrade after use, and then minimizing the potential for accidents through safer process chemical selection makes such sense. And as we apply more and more chemical hazard assessments throughout the supply chain, there hopefully will be the less need for these wonderful GHS pictograms on the right side of, uh, of this table. So before we dive into chemical hazard assessment, it's important to reflect upon what's hazard? What are we doing? And it's not a hazard versus risk argument. It's important to understand the terminology that we're working with within the chemical hazard assessment arena. Hazard is the inherent property of a substance that has the potential to cause adverse effects when an organism, et cetera, is exposed to that substance. And then risk is the probability of an adverse effect in an organism, et cetera, under specific, specified circumstances of exposure. So it's the probability of harm. And here's a fun example uh, that I've, uh, I've used a few times with some interns to show them the difference between hazard and risk. I have a client on the West Coast who has a tree that has one and a half pound lemons, and I actually got one. 
it just dwarfs this tiny little Macintosh apple on my desk. Now, there's a moderate hazard from that lemon in the form of D-limonene, if I were exposed to that D-limonene in the presence of an oxidant, but really in reality, there's a low risk in its unpeeled form. The only risk it poses is, I guess, if I hurled it across the office and boinked someone on their head. So it's important to understand the difference between hazard, the inherent potential to cause harm, and then risk. Secondly, now that we understand kind of what hazard is, it's a potential for harm, it's important to understand the categories of hazard that we're trying to reduce. Obviously, you always want to formulate to reduce uh, priority hazards, such as carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, reproductive developmental toxicity for human health, as well as reduce the levels of PBTs, if not eliminate them in your formulations. You don't want chemicals that persist in the environment and bioaccumulate. But equally important, especially for consumer products, what are classically considered to be non-priority health effects are really important to think about as well. Europeans have been way up to speed in terms of reducing the presence of skin sensitizers, but if you're making a lotion, for example, and you want to get rid of branch parabens, which are you know, very common uh, preservatives in lotions, you don't want to substitute it with a preservative that's likely to be a skin sensitizer, because you'll be out of business after a few years because no one will purchase your lotion again. Equally important are aquatic toxicity hazards. If you're making a textile treatment formulation that's likely to be dumped into a waterway, you don't want to kill the organisms in the waterway. Equally important, let's say for pesticides, you want to make sure that you're not going to injure non-target organisms such as birds or bees. And then if you're a formulator, you're going to want to make sure you pick uh, chemicals or raw materials that are not likely to be reactive or flammable. So there are many categories of hazards that you need to think about when you formulate. So we've talked about hazard, we've uh, introduced the concept of risk as well, and talked about categories of hazards, but we haven't yet defined what a chemical hazard assessment is. But before I do that, let's just point out that a chemical hazard assessment is a critical component of a chemical alternatives assessment. And you can perform a chemical hazard assessment as part or independently of a full chemical alternatives assessment. I spend uh, probably 70% of my time in the chemical hazard assessment arena and 30% in the chemical alternatives assessment arena. And most chemical alternatives assessment go through the six steps below, but you'll see that chemical hazard assessment plays um, a big role in a chemical alternatives assessment. One of the most common definitions used for a chemical hazard assessment is a systematic process of assessing and classifying hazards across an entire spectrum of endpoints and severity. And that's very key. You don't want to have a chemical hazard assessment that looks at one endpoint, and then you conclude something isn't hazardous because you're probably going to be wrong. So it's important to follow a systematic process, and as you'll hear from Lauren in a few minutes, it's important to look across an entire spectrum of endpoints as well as severity so you can make sure you're assessing those hazards correctly. And this webinar is not designed to go into chemical alternatives assessments. But because chemical hazard assessment plays such an important role in every single alternatives assessment out there, I just want to touch upon a new addition, so to speak, of the alternatives assessment family. The most recent addition is California DTSC's alternative assessment guidelines for their safer consumer product regulations, as you'll see on the icon there. But there are seven chemical alternatives assessments that are in use across the world. Really, the focus of a chemical alternatives assessment, whatever framework you're following, is to find alternative chemicals, materials, or product designs to substitute for the use of hazardous chemicals. The alternative doesn't have to be chemical in nature. And when properly conducted, an alternatives assessment provides the means to avoid regrettable substitution and really does promote the selection of safer chemicals or materials. One of my favorite uh, chemical alternatives assessment guides out there is the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse AA guide that was released in December of 2013 because it's transparent and it's a good how-to guide, which is still really important because there are probably fewer than 70 alternatives assessments out there. And of course, we need to mention the NRC report, a framework to guide selection of chemical alternatives uh, that Joel was a big part of that was released at the end of 2014 that really is a wonderful resource to understand all the ins and outs of an alternatives assessment, and it's really downloadable from the NRC website in PDF form. Here are um, some examples of how chemical hazard assessments uh, can uh, help you pick safer ingredients. Chemical hazard assessments are used in alternative assessments, as mentioned before, 
their uh, biz NGO just released their alternatives assessment report for alternatives to methylene chloride and paint strippers and varnish strippers uh, that contains more than a dozen green screen for safer chemical hazard assessments. You can download that report for free. Um, there's also the state of Washington piloted the IC2 alternatives assessment guide, which contains more than two dozen uh, green screen chemical hazard assessments. So it's great to see how chemical hazard assessments have really served an important role um, in helping identify safer chemicals using an alternatives assessment framework. Chemical hazard assessments are also commonly used to identify chemicals of concern, as well as safer alternatives. Uh, ZDHC members now use chemical hazard assessments to select safer chemicals in textile formulations throughout the world. A good example of how hazard assessments are used to inform development of new chemicals or formulations was the GC3 project uh, that evaluated alternatives to phthalate plasticizers. And hazard assessments are also used by big corporations to track progress in managing chemical inventories. And now chemical hazard assessments are incorporated into numerous eco-labels and standards. For example, the USGBC LEED standard for buildings now awards credits to materials with green screens or green screen list tra translator results. And now TCO Development Certified Displays 7.0, that's a mouthful, now requires green screen assessments of non-halogenated flame retardants in flat panel displays. Most of us right now are looking at flat panel displays and on the back of every single one of those, most likely, is a TCO certified stamp. So it's uh, really neat to see how chemical hazard assessments are really moving through off facets of the supply chain to promote safer chemical selection. So I get the question all the time, because I did start out as a risk assessor, and I still am. Meg, why do, why do I need to learn something new? Why do I have to learn chemical hazard assessment or alternatives assessment? I'm a really good risk assessor, and I've been doing it for so many years. And I say to someone, you need to learn it because chemical hazard assessment, as well as alternatives assessment, is designed to answer a very different question than risk assessment. They're both great methods, but they're designed to do different things. Uh, terms assessment, as well as the chemical hazard assessment, they're intended to answer the question, hmm, which chemical or product poses a lower hazard? Versus a risk assessment, which is designed to answer the question, is this chemical or product safe enough for the intended use? It's a very, very different question. And I put this figure together a couple months ago for a, a manuscript that will come out next month in risk analysis, where we're looking at risk assessment compared to alternatives assessment, but it's great to see how chemical hazard assessment is quite good at enabling prioritization of chemicals for reduction or phase out, but where it really shines is assisting in the selection of alternative chemicals for banned or restricted chemicals or materials, for chemicals that are perceived as hazardous by the public. Let's say someone doesn't want to have BPA anymore in their product line. Chemical hazard assessment can do a great job picking alternatives and making sure there's no regrettable substitution. It's also wonderful at developing environmentally preferred products because a chemical hazard assessment will look at both human health and environmental fate and tox endpoints. Most risk assessments will concentrate on human health and on a specific priority health effect endpoint. So chemical hazard assessment does something that a risk assessment just isn't designed to do. And then a chemical hazard assessment is quite good at identifying and classifying restricted use substances. In contrast to risk assessment, can also inform prioritization of chemicals for reduction or phase out. Let's say you want to uh, put on an ordinal scale all the carcinogens in your supply chain. You can rank them in order of statistical probability of getting cancer, for example. It can also estimate the probability of harm following exposure. Let's say you have 1,4-dioxane in your shampoo but it does something very different than a chemical hazard assessment. So it's important to recognize that they're intended to answer very different questions. Uh, now Lauren's gonna take us on a journey to begin learning about the intricacies of chemical hazard assessment. So I'll turn it over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Meg, for that excellent background. Yes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some tools for chemical hazard assessment, starting with the tools that are most data resource slash expertise intensive uh, down to the least data resource expertise intensive 
So a full chemical hazard assessment, examples would include the green screen for safer chemicals or a full green screen, and also the design for the environment alternatives assessment criteria for hazard evaluation. They're actually quite similar in their hazard endpoints. Both of them are based significantly on the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. They include approximately 18 hazard endpoints, depending how you slice it. If you consider the aquatic toxicity as three, then that makes it more like 24, because there are three different species that are considered. They include a review of all the available literature, and you really need a comprehensive assessment like the DFE or green screen to identify a safer alternative. At the other end of the complexity is the green screen list translator. And this is a tool uh, that reviews only list-based data sources. So if there are lists such as the National Toxicology Program list of carcinogens, um, you can start with simply just chemicals on such lists and flag them and score them according to their presence or absence on the list. But this is a quick and dirty approach to chemical hazard assessment. Um, the nice thing is that it's been automated by Healthy Building Network and their Ferros tool. It's very inexpensive to use and very fast, but it's, it's not a great tool for identifying truly safer options. And then we have the quick chemical assessment tool that Meg will talk about in a little bit. And this falls kind of halfway in between a list translator and a green screen because it uses a subset of endpoints and, in, and includes a literature review for those endpoints and also a different scoring system. So it can be a good tool when you don't have uh, quite the amount of resources, but you need a little more depth than a list translator. So the GHS is the Globally Harmonized System for Classification and Labeling. And that's, the, of course, the European spelling. It's known as the Purple Book. We're up to um, uh, the sixth edition now, coming out in 2015. New versions come out every two years. It specifies criteria for classifying health, uh, physical, and environmental hazards. And it was really developed to harmonize hazard communication on products. In the old days, you could have a tiny little product with a massive amount of documentation that included hazards with pictograms from different countries. So every country had their own way of communicating hazards, and that could become uh, quite confusing. And so it was, GHS was born out of the UN's 1992 Earth Summit, and it was written up in Chapter 19 of the Agenda 21 report. Now, it's not mandatory for every co country in the world to adhere to GHS, but countries are moving in those directions. And as of today, about 67 countries have a, a job, adopted GHS, including the US uh, just recently this past summer. GHS is built on 16 physical, 10 health, and three environmental hazard classes. It includes pictograms, such as that one, which you would not want to see on anything you are using or consuming. It includes signal words, such as danger or warning. It includes um, hazard statements and precautionary statements, which would say things like, you know, do not uh, mix with water or something like that, as opposed to hazard, which would be it causes cancer. But the GHS has some limitations, at least for chemical hazard assessment. First of all, I don't really think it was designed for this application. It just happens to be quite good at it. And because of its design, really, for hazard communication, there's a few limitations. For example, GHS does not provide independent, discrete hazard classification criteria for persistence um, alone. Um, it does integrate persistence into some other criteria, but it doesn't treat persistence as a standalone hazard, which, in a way, it's not, because beach sand is highly persistent, and that doesn't make it hazardous. Likewise, it doesn't offer hazard classification criteria for bioaccumulation as a standalone endpoint. And those are, in a sense, exposure 
endpoints anyway, not hazard, but they're usually included in a hazard assessment. And also, GHS does not include hazard classification for endocrine disruption, and that, um, I believe, is more um, a factor of the lack of uh, consensus around classifying the potency of endocrine disruptors than it is, um, it clearly is a hazard. Another downside of GHS is that at least for aquatic toxicity, chronic and acute, the category one is not really that toxic in the sense that category one hazards are the most severe hazards and then the higher numbers reflect lower hazards and different endpoints. Some endpoints have just one or two categories, some endpoints have up to five different categories. But for acute toxicity, Category one, for example, would for fish would be um, an LC50 of less than one part per million for acute aquatic toxicity. But what this wouldn't tell you is that um, if you had two chemicals that had the same profile in a hazard table, you wouldn't be able to tell if the aquatic toxicity was less than one in the form of 0.9 or if the aquatic toxicity was less than one in the form of 0 0.0009. So you could have many orders of magnitude difference in toxicity, but still they would both be classified as category one. And so I think there's a need for greater discrimination there, particularly when you're talking about things that are biocides, i.e. pesticides or antimicrobials. And finally, GHS does not address classification criteria for specific species such as birds and bees. Fortunately, the DFE criteria do include some uh, criteria for birds and bees uh, as optional endpoints which you can use. So to visualize how the hazard profile is usually presented, you'll see the use of hazard tables. Here's an example from the green screen where you see hazard classifications as high, medium, or low for the group one human endpoint, um, for the group twos, you'll see DG where there's a data gap, you'll see italic font where there's low confidence based on models and bold font where there's more confidence based on test data. But a good chemical hazard assessment typically will include human toxicity, environmental toxicity, fate, and also physical properties. And so these really are at kind of the top of the pyramid or actually the bottom of an inverted pyramid. And so as you go to the tools that require uh, less resources such as QCAT, List Translator, or even a safety data sheet, which would have the least amount of transparency. So when you look at a product, typically it will have more than one chemical in it. And so this is a, a visualization of a product that Talk Services assessed where they assess every single ingredient in it. It's a, it's, a, it's a product used in the textile sector, and you can look at every ingredient, the percent of that ingredient in the formulation, and you can see um, how the ingredients fare in terms of what you know and what you don't know with respect to data gaps and where there are hot spots with respect to hazards or fate or ecotoxicity endpoints. And you can see in the far right that you can capture the green screen benchmark scores. And this gives you a nice sense of formula as a whole. And most of these hazard tools, such as DFE and green screen, do include the hazard tables as described in the prior slides. And green screen adds an extra layer onto the hazard table, which um, is an algorithm that results in a benchmark. And so a benchmark one refers to a chemical that is basically a substance of very high concern under reach or in the Canadian DSL system. It's the definition of a benchmark one aligns with some of the regulatory drivers. So these are chemicals that are CMRs or PBTs or endocrine disruptors. And a benchmark four chemical has low hazard across all endpoints. And benchmarks two and three are increase, increasingly moved toward the benchmark for low hazard 
system. So uh, this is very helpful with a kind of global comparison that some people like to eliminate the benchmark one chemicals as a step one because those can be potentially substances of very high concern and are potentially going to be put on authoritative or screening lists um, in the REACH system. But it's important not to only base decisions on the benchmarks. For example, um, most chemicals fall into the benchmark two range, but not all benchmark two chemicals are equivalent. Something could be a benchmark two chemical based solely on irritation, like lemon juice, perhaps, while something else could be a benchmark two because it has moderate carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, repro, and developmental toxicity. So those would be very different in terms of how you might perceive their health effects. And another innovation that has come through working with tox services and others is this optional format for a green screen, which is called a stratified green screen. And I think this is a very important innovation because it allows you to break out the hazards based on the exposure route. And the reason this is important is because if you only present um, the lowest and or the only hazard classification score you have for a particular endpoint, then you might mask some very important data gaps. So for example, I always wonder if there had been a good stratified green screen of diacetyl, which is used as artificial butter in popcorn, if, if there had been data gaps for the inhalation of this chemical. Because we know that eating it is very safe, but it was only after the fact that it was determined that it was terrible for workers' lungs and for the lungs of people who ate an awful lot of um, uh, microwave popcorn. So I think it's very important to know what you know and know what you don't know. And I think in the future, you could even stratify the environmental fate and toxicity endpoints further by breaking out the fish, daphne, and algae species and the type of persistence you are seeing. Is it in water, air, and sediment, aerobic, anaerobic, et cetera? But the point here is um, that the benchmarks are useful, but don't look only at the benchmarks because there's a lot of information in a report that should inform um, decision making. Um, and so uh, back to Meg. So I'm going to talk about, for those of you who aren't ready for the Rolls Royce yet of chemical hazard assessment tools, which green screen is in my opinion. Um, another great tool is the quick chemical assessment tool. And it is based on green screen methodology, but as I'll talk about in a minute or two, it's not as complete or complicated, um, and it's faster, and you don't have to be a PhD toxicologist to perform it. The methodology for QCAT is available on the web, as is a QCAT template that you can follow when filling out a QCAT. It's version 1.3, and it was developed by the Washington State Department of Ecology. And it was intended as a tool for small and medium-sized businesses with limited resources and expertise. It evaluates nine hazard endpoints, and as I'll talk about in a minute, they're great hazard endpoints to classify that every chemical should have an assessment performed against. It's a two-step process. The first step is classifying hazards for each of the nine hazard endpoints. It's based heavily on list searching, as well as checking specific sites for experimental or modeling data to try and classify hazards for each of those nine endpoints that are assessed. It goes through a grading process, and there are two grades that it assigns. There's an initial grade where you ignore the data gaps, and then a data gap grade, and then an overall QCAT grade that's assigned for the chemical by the selecting the lower of the initial or the data gap grade. There are four grades you can earn, so to speak, or a chemical can earn that goes through the QCAT process. A is the best. B, C, and F. Hopefully no one on the call ever has received an F, but uh, we want to stay away from chemicals that are really grade C and grade F. So QCAT evaluates nine hazard endpoints versus the 18 in a green screen. And Lauren and I have shaded the nine hazard endpoints that a QCAT examines. These are considered priority health effects. We can't live as a species, for example, long term if we're exposed to high levels of carcinogens or reproductive or developmental toxicants. 
Similarly, acute toxicity is folded into the QCAT, which is very important, particularly for chemicals that are used in industrial settings. It does incorporate acute aquatic toxicity as well as persistence and bioaccumulation. So it's really focusing in on the nuts and bolts of uh, some of the critical hazards that are out there that, are, that every chemical should be evaluated against. So there's some positives and negatives associated with the QCAT tool. It can be used as part of an alternative assessment, and it is positively it's simpler and easier to implement than a full green screen. A green screen takes about 25 hours to perform for a fairly data-rich chemical once you go through the training process. Uh, we can get through a QCAT in eight to 10 hours, and to give you some idea of level of effort. The QCAT will result in fewer regrettable substitutions because you're able to characterize hazards for priority health effect and environmental fate and tox endpoints. Uh, but you do have less confidence that an alternative is truly green because admittedly it's not as complete as a detailed chemical hazard assessment or alternatives assessment. But it is good in that it introduces companies to the AA or chemical hazard assessment process. You have to start somewhere, and so I'm a supporter of the QCAT. We've included a QCAT for propylene glycol that Dr. Alex Stone prepared, and it shows that data were found for eight of the nine hazard endpoints evaluated in a QCAT, everything except endocrine activity, which uh, admittedly is a common data gap for chemical hazard assessments. And an overall grade of B was assigned, which shows that uh, we have slight concern with this solvent. This is a relatively safe solvent that we see all the time. So it's a great tool. It is designed to be fast and used with limited training. So I encourage you to consider it. Now, for those of you who are in a rush, 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 the Green Screenless Translator is the fastest chemical hazard assessment tool out there. It does readily identify chemicals of concern, and the hazard classifications are based on authoritative listings. It doesn't require toxicology expertise. You have to know how to type in a cast number or a chemical name which on a Friday afternoon for me can be sometimes challenging, but uh, it's a relatively easy to use tool. It's intended to identify bad actors, not good actors. It does very well certain things. It can identify benchmark one chemicals, and there are three scores that you can get using the green screen list translator. One of the scores is an LT1, and that means the chemical is likely to be a benchmark one. So for example, likely to be CMR or PBT in a simplistic explanation, unless proven otherwise. Or it can determine, hmm, this is likely to be a potential benchmark one, which would take someone trained in chemical hazard assessment to look at the results and say, is that really an LT1 or a benchmark one? And then for many chemicals, particularly newer chemicals that haven't had the chance to circulate and be evaluated by authoritative bodies, it will result in something called an LTU meaning hazards unassignable. And that means that that chemical needs to undergo a more robust assessment to determine its overall chemical hazard profile. There are a couple different ways you can uh, get access to the Green Screen List Translator. When uh, we originally started doing this, there was only a manual version. So you had to manually go through almost 70 lists of hazard classification. But luckily now, Healthy Building Network has incorporated and automated the Green Screen List Translator and built that into Pharos, which is a very inexpensive tool to use. So we've included a screenshot of a List Translator 1 chemical called dichlorobenzene. This chemical is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen. It's also reprotoxic. It's classified as a Category 1B reproductive toxicant. And in addition to that, it will also irritate your eyes and skin and sensitize your skin on top of giving you potentially cancer and reproductive toxicity. It's great because Pharos can give you that answer within seconds. Pharos, as I'll talk about in a couple slides, continues to grow their library of chemicals. So it's a great initial tool to screen hazards. So the goal of all of these chemical hazard assessment tools is so that you can make informed decisions whether you're formulating or you're deciding to reformulate a product because a chemical has popped up on a chemical of concern list, for example. But as you heard from Lauren, you need to think about the chemical specific application and use. You can't just use the result for all benchmark score or a QCAT score. For example, a benchmark three chemical, which is a great uh, green screen chemical hazard assessment score in my opinion, but if that chemical has moderate or high eye irritation, that wouldn't be a good choice for an eye wash. Similarly, if you're making a wearable electronic, you're not going to want to use an adhesive or some kind of coating on that that's likely 
to contain high levels of a skin sensitizer. So you need to you know, use it in an informed way, just like if you're using a risk assessment. We do always want to apply risk management. Risk management is not a bad term. And for those of you who aren't risk assessors or risk analyzers, that's defined as the process of identifying, selecting, and implementing actions to reduce risk to human health and ecosystems. And so all chemicals need risk management, but it's a lot easier to do that if you start out with inherently safer chemicals, meaning you've thought about those 12 principles of green chemistry and really wherever possible tried to apply them. So here's a nice example of how chemical hazard assessment is used in real life to make informed decisions. Here's an example of a green screen benchmark score distribution for a textile finishing formulation. It's actually a water repellent used on textile. This one shows, hmm, the formulation contains a number of benchmark one ingredients, and these ingredients were CMRs and or PBT, so not nice chemicals. And also an equal number of ingredients in that formulation are something called green screen benchmark U. They didn't even have sufficient data for us to characterize the overall hazard of those chemicals in the formulation which is almost as bad, not quite as bad, but almost as bad, because we're not able to even, from a risk management point of view, say, hmm, there's nothing safer. You can use this under these exposure conditions. So what the formulator did is he's right now working on first removing those green screen benchmark one chemicals from the formulation, and then we're working with their suppliers to obtain uh, unpublished data on those benchmark U chemicals to try and get more data on them to really classify the hazards. So in this case, chemical hazard assessment was used quite successfully to, uh, at the end of the day, that person will have a better water repellent formulation to sell to our clothing manufacturers. Uh, with that, now I'm going to turn the baton over to Lauren, who's going to talk about some of the challenges and growth of CHA. Thank you, Meg. I caught the baton. Um, <laughs> One of the challenges with uh, chemical hazard assessment is dealing with toxicity across the life cycle. There are two ways that this becomes very important. One, you don't want to necessarily select a chemical that is safer at one stage in the life cycle, but that is extremely toxic, perhaps upstream to workers or downstream to recyclers. So you need to think about toxicity across the life cycle. And secondly, you can make, often you can make the same chemical via different pathways. And the chemicals you use in different pathways can result in different contaminants and byproducts. So this uh, rather odd looking slide uh, came from the recent CTAC conference where we talked about how to integrate life cycle assessment and chemical hazard assessment. And the size of the circles here represent um, the emissions toxicity associated with uh, chemicals and the colors of the circles represent the hazards of the chemicals associated that are used. And then these little boxes represent the potential for exposure to workers or users. And so there are still a lot of challenges. And thinking about toxicity across the life cycle and hazard across the life cycle is one of the challenges we face, especially because alternatives assessment does require us to think about life cycle impacts. And that is an area of development. Another area of development is how do you think about assessing mixtures? Meg showed that nice pie chart of ingredients in a product and how the manufacturer was working to eliminate the benchmark ones and to get data on the benchmark use, which is an excellent strategy. But there are some times when you do have good data, perhaps there's a lot of twos and threes in there and, and you want to compare options. So Northwest Green Chemistry has uh, created a scorecard for alternatives to copper-based anti-fouling paints. It looks at the use and cost and longevity, et cetera, um, and is scoring all of the individual ingredients. So here you can see a breakout of some of the in individual ingredients. There are active ingredients and inert ingredients, but we're getting to the place now where we have to decide which one is, which formulation is better and why. And so the idea of how do you treat mixtures 
is actually very challenging. As Meg pointed out, some people will just eliminate the benchmark one, SBHCs. Some people, after they do that, they might think about doing a weighted average. They might think about using the GHS or what are called the CLP in the European regulatory system, mixture rules. It's not really clear what the best approach is yet. I know that at Northwest Green Chemistry, we're evaluating some products, one of which is a, a zinc-free marine bumper, which is a good alternative to tires which leach uh, all sorts of nasty things, including, what did you say was the common leachate, Mike? Uh, zinc mercaptobenzothiazole is a good one, <laughs> vulcanization <Thank> accelerator. <laughs> OK, that's one that this uh, alternative bumper does not have. But when you're thinking about bringing products to the market, there isn't always enough funding to do green screen of every single ingredient in the product. So the first step we're doing is a whole product testing approach and comparing the new bumper to the conventional bumpers. And, and if the new bumper doesn't appear to be better in a whole product aquatic toxicity testing system, then there's really no point in looking further. So we call this a fail fast strategy. Test it um, using a tiered strategy. Fail fast if it's not going to be better. And then we still have work to do to think about how to really think about complex mixtures of things. Because sometimes those mixtures might all be used in the life, same life cycle stage, but sometimes they're not. For example, a boat paint, you might, the solvents will affect the workers, but they may not be relevant to the fish on the, um, once the boat is in the water. So these are challenges that are still to be resolved. Back to you, Meg. Mm, thanks, Lauren. Well, Lauren and I have been working on a mixtures tool that's going to be automated, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to, in the next few months, uh, pilot that out. So it's something that I've spent a lot of time at. I spent my PhD working on evaluating the toxicity of mixtures with Bruce Fowler, and it's the next place where we need to go in addition to thinking about more life cycle attributes. So let's talk for a few minutes about resources. Uh, we've talked about chemical hazard assessments and shown you how they're used to uh, inform alternatives assessments or help inform safer chemical selections. But there are lots of publicly accessible resources you can use to start uh, performing chemical hazard assessments right away. The first step is to first identify safer chemicals. And right now, there are great lists out there that you can use for intelligent material selection or substitution. The Ferris Material Health Library continues to grow and now has more than 37,000 chemicals in it. The IC2 Chemical Hazards Database has free green screens and QCATs for download, as well as the CPA's green screen store. TechStreet has green screens available for purchase. Um, and it's great to look at the OECD Substitution and Alternatives Assessment Toolbox. We are working harder to get all of these tools and assessments out there publicly, uh, particularly for chemicals that are so boring, I don't want to make another chemical assessor have to go through the pain again. There are many databases that identify regulatory hazard risk or exposure-related information. Because remember, we pointed out that every chemical does need risk management. So we'd be silly to say, only look at sources that relate to hazard. That's not realistic. So there's the US EPA ChemView database is great to use. And the OECD eChem portal is a great way to type in a cast number or a chemical name and see, hmm, who else in the world has been working on that chemical? For those of you that do want to get into chemical hazard assessment, I was actually talking with someone uh, at the state level today who's ready to dig more into QSAR. There are lots of software systems that are out there. I tend to use the publicly accessible ones since I work for many governments that can't afford expensive software such as Derek. And the primary ones we use are, for example, Ecosar and EpiSuite. If you Google something called Sustainable Futures, you can see when the next training session is coming up. EPA is in charge of that. They just unfortunately had one about two months ago, so it'll probably be another six months until there's another Sustainable Futures course. I highly recommend taking QSAR Toolbox training. The bonus is it's in Barcelona, Spain, which is a great trip. But to use that tool, and use it intelligently and correctly, you really need 40 hours of training. So there is adequate training, and our community of practice grows so that you know, more people can be practicing and using QSAR in order to make informed hazard decisions. Secondly, there are great organizations that are committed to pursuing and supporting chemical alternatives assessments and chemical hazard assessments. 
GC3, of course, uh, <laughs> who's sponsoring this, is a big, big player. And it's exciting to see Seventh Generation is holding the spring meeting. It'll be beautiful in Burlington. So I hope those on the webinar want to attend that. I'll be there. Northwest Green Chemistry, where Lauren just took over as interim executive director, is uh, really key in identifying safer alternatives, et cetera. Uh, they're planning on holding QCAT training, uh, hopefully in the spring. And let's not forget BizNGO, which is founded by CPA, the developers of Green Screen. Their annual meeting is coming up in December, so I hope some of you can attend that. CPA also does hold green screen training courses, both on-site and then remotely. Uh, we're finishing up the most recent practitioner course right now. So check those organizations out. The people in there are very committed to helping foster the community of practice. The best way, you know, I always say to learn how to do this is to see what's been done. And there are dozens of examples of alternative assessments and chemical hazard assessments online. So I've given you the links to some of the uh, the ones that I've learned from, uh, US EPA's Design for the Environment, those are great resources to look at. My company was lucky enough to work with the state of Washington to pilot the IC2 guidelines, and within that report are more than 24 green screen chemical hazard assessments. It's always good to look at one of the first ones. I love looking at Tory's five chemical alternatives assessment study, and it's hard to believe a decade has gone by, but it's good to see what was done in the past to learn, hmm, what are the challenges we need to look at in the future? And as I mentioned before, the IC2 has green screens and QCAT assessments available for free download. So check those out. And you know, don't be shy to contact the authors of those uh, chemical hazard assessments if you have questions. So in conclusion, chemical hazard assessment is a critical component of intelligent material design and formulation. Hazard reduction promotes the design or redesign of materials and products that reduce or eliminate the use or generation of hazardous substances. And if you remember, this is the literal definition of green chemistry and benefits the user of the material, i.e. your company and the world at large. So we hope you adopt this. I've given our contact information. Lauren and I are friendly folks, so feel free to contact us. And uh, we're available to answer your questions now. Um, there are a number of questions. Are there external options for companies who want to perform chemical hazard assessments but don't have assessors on staff? I'll uh, dig into that. There are multiple green screen profilers now. Their uh, gradient was just recently added as well. Um, you can find the names of those through the Clean Production Action website. And I encourage you to contact them all and get competitive bids. So yes, um, there are many <laughs> sources you can go to. The three main ones are Talk Services, NSF, and Gradient. And um, Talk That's Services better. is Extremely. Oh yes, and sorry, and, and Cyvera and Talk Services is, is extremely experienced in this regard. Is it possible to give a, a range about how much these chemical assess assessments cost? Um, sure, you can. Tech Street has many chemical hazard assessments. There's been about I've performed, we've performed about 700 green screens to date, and Tech Street has them available for $250 per green screen. If it's a brand new green screen, it's a chemical that's never been assessed a profiler will probably charge between $1,500 all the way to $3,000 to assess it. When you think about we have to look at 18 endpoints for risk assessment, we'll often have you know, four to five times the budget. We're only looking at a critical health effect endpoint. Um, the green screen, for example, or the QCAT are screens. We have to look at a lot of endpoints very quickly, but I always encourage look on IC2 first, look on Tech Street and see has it already been done. If not, you can contact a profiler and get a cost estimate there. So um, it shouldn't have to cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> That's right. And, and the, strat, the, the tools that we presented, the list translator, the QCAT, and the full green screen, it may be possible to know what you need to know um, with a QCAT and not need to do a full assessment, for example, if you find out it has hazards that um, you don't want in your product. If I was to hire an external company to assess the chemicals, do I have to disclose proprietary formulas to perform a chemical hazard assessment? Yes, you would, but you would go to, that's the reason for going to a profiler because they will sign a non-disclosure agreement with you, but they cannot assess a product unless you reveal 
the ingredients, but that information would be kept fully confidential. Anything to add there, Meg? So uh, we often screen many, many hundreds of textile treatment formulations for ZDHC member companies, and what we do is sign an NDA with the supplier, and then we redact the report so that the hazards are still disclosed. But the IP in terms of the cast number and chemical name of the individual ingredients are shielded so that the hazards are transparent and it's clear how the hazards were classified, but uh, the IP of that supplier is protected. So we get to see full disclosure, every intentionally added ingredient and residuals above 0.01%, but uh, the IP of that supplier is protected. And because we're, we're a verified profiler, we can undergo audit by clean production action and they ensure that you know we're playing by the rules and that that assessment is an accurate characterization of the hazards of all of those ingredients in that formulation. Uh, we did that with the GC3 plasticizer pilot program where a number of those plasticizers were proprietary and that worked great in a uh, you know consortium because the suppliers were able to uh, share their confidential information, formulation information and toxicological information with us and still allow us to help reduce those hazards and identify safer uh, plasticizers. Another question is, why are there so many separate chemical hazard assessment resources? Uh, do they all use the same data, and are they all as good as each other? Hmm, that's the golden ring question. A certified green screen should be a certified green screen regardless where you look, and they expire after three years. But there is no one central uh, repository right now, and that's been a challenge, and it's still of interest to a number of people to how to, how to make that work. There are business model challenges and other information flow challenges that just haven't been solved yet. Meg, anything but, to add? Uh, well, the important point to note, though, is that the whether we're talking about the chemical hazard assessment tools, something like green screen or QCAT is based upon GHS hazard classification. So they're similar, the tools are similar in that aspect. Green screen looks at more endpoints. But just like in the risk assessment community, if you went to one consulting firm, you may get a different result than another consulting firm. Ideally, we have a vision of trying to have a shared communal database of hazard classifications or assessments rather the challenge is some people will take from the cookie jar more than they put in. And I guess the challenge is I have is trying to find a way to make sure that uh, those assessments stay updated, accurate, and precise as much as they can, <laughs> and current. So uh, we're trying to get there so that smaller businesses that want to try and practice green chemistry and reduce hazards can still participate and not get priced out. I mean, I, that, I think that's the beauty of the U.S. EPA Safer Chemical Ingredients List. This is a great example of how the government is taking a leadership role in identifying safer ingredients. And, you know, we're lucky enough to help contribute to uh, the skill list. So I'm a supporter of it, and I hope it continues to grow in terms of publicly accessible uh, hazard classification information. Another question is, if you had a formula, like how low do you go? What level do you look at with respect to the chemicals in your product. Is there a standard? Yes. So green screen does allow higher than, what is it, 1,000 ppm if you disclose that on a green screen. We tend to look at, uh, in a formulation, every single uh, intentionally added ingredient and then residuals such as, let's say, you've got monomers or you've got low-level uh, impurities from a surfactant. We look at those at levels above 0.01% in a formulation. You know, but it would be very difficult to try and say if someone says to me, and it's happened in the past, well, I can really only show you two-thirds of my formulation. The, the, that remaining one-third is just so special. Um, there's no way to really accurately classify the hazard of the overall formulation based on that. That's one thing with signing an NDA with a chemical hazard assessor, just like if, you know, you're having someone perform a risk assessment. It's important to know the overall formulation that you're assessing. Particularly in an alternatives assessment, you need to be able to characterize the full Monty. So we specify that we need to know everything. <laughs> Another question is, will you or can you briefly describe the mixtures tool that you're developing? But if you can't, do you have an estimate as to when it would be more publicly available? Well, we've been working on it now for about four months, and it's based primarily on CLP, which is European Europe's a version of GHS, where we want to but remember, GHS doesn't cover all endpoints. 
So we're going to put it through uh, beta testing and make sure, obviously, that it works and note the caveats of it. Uh, because there's not really a publicly accessible mixtures tool yet. So we're just starting to, we just finished four months of working on the automated algorithm. Um, and we're trying to build it into something we have that's free called the Green Screen Inspector. And we make sure that the inspector can reliably, you know, also uh, assess the combination of chemical ingredients and the hazards in a mixture. So I'm guessing probably three month, three more months of beta testing. And then we, we've we got a few willing guinea pigs who, uh, so to speak, who are going to be uh, working with us to give us feedback on whether they feel the boundaries that we've set for hazard classification or mixture are a good idea. <laughs> hey, Lauren, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's... That's great. If anyone else wants to be a willing guinea pig, can they, is there a way, or they just have to oh, wait? Sure. No, no, you can contact Lauren and myself, and we're happy to discuss it with you. Um, obviously, something like this has to go through peer review. We're scientists, and we want to make sure that there's generic buy-in into the rationale that we've used for setting boundaries for the tool. Knowing that uh, mixtures, both risk assessment and hazard classification, have always stymied toxicologists and risk assessors. I'm vice president of the SOT mixture specialty section, and you know it's fascinating to see that we're still just taking baby steps in assessing the toxicity of mixtures, but yet everything we're exposed to, it's, it's all a mixture. So this is something that's very important to me. So sure, please contact us, and, uh, and we're happy to talk to you about it. So final question. How do you think these tools help advance safer chemical design versus product design? That's a really interesting question. For safer chemical design, I think it can really um, illustrate the attributes that a chemical should have. Um, I remember years ago working with Axo Nobel, who was making a surfactant, and they knew that the criteria that they were seeking had to have relatively low aquatic toxicity, good performance, and rapid biodegradability. And because that, those were the properties of a surfactant that were needed for use in cleaning products. So those hazard criteria really stood out as design goals for the molecule. So that then limited the amount of branching that could be in the molecule. They had to uh, choose design elements that were less toxic to fish. And it was really an optimization exercise for them and something that chemists do all the time. That, that's a nice, tangible example. The other really interesting way that uh, this comes into play is that often, as uh, we showed, there are chemicals that don't have enough data right, to classify at all. And so that means we need predictive toxicology tools. And there's a nice nexus between uh, the predictive toxicology tools someone would use to develop a new molecule and the predictive toxicology tools that people would use to evaluate a chemical that already exists but doesn't have data. So there's a nice sort of uh, overlap between filling data gaps and designing new molecules. Um, surely there's some pieces that are different, but really if you know that certain functional groups are going to cause toxicity on a molecule, you will know that whether the chem chemical is made or whether you're thinking about designing it from scratch. So that's a really interesting area where new design and filling data gap also needs to further develop. Meg, anything else? No, I, I mean, I think it's great to see chemical hazard assessment really mature. Our community of practice continues to grow. It's exciting. As I said, it's different than a risk assessment. It's designed to answer a different question. But at the core of it, it's really designed to support and promote green engineers like Lauren. I mean, I'm just a service person. I'm designed to help reduce those hazards so that people out there who are formulating um, can make those safer surfactants, safer formulations, et cetera. So um, I think this is great. I think in five years we're going to be even further along and we're going to accomplish some of these challenges and meet these goals we talked about in today's uh, webinar. So um, we'll see where we are in five years. I love challenges and goals, and um, I'm going to work hard to make that happen. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for your presentation. Great. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you.